Hello everyone, my name is Jasmine and welcome to my channel. If you are new here, thank you for clicking to see what's going on. If you are a returner, it's nice to see you again. And yes, the title is the title. I have a lot of thoughts, especially with the Olympics coming to a close. It has brought to light the policing of the female athlete. And I really shouldn't even be be saying brought to light because it's something that has existed for a very long time and has been pervasive in our sports athletics world. I have three pages of notes written on my iPad so if you see me looking down that's why but we're going to cover a wide range of topics. We're going to talk about the policing of the female athlete's body, the policing of the clothes that she wears on her body, and the policing of even the hormones that that body produces. So we're starting big, going small. And I am going to be putting uh, timestamps in the video. So if you want to hear me talk about a specific one of those three things, feel free to use those. But um, let's jump right in. The policing of first, the female athlete's body. The body of an athlete, whether male or female, is something that obviously has to be talked about. It is something that will be observed, scrutinized, something that is of major focus because the body is what that person uses to compete. It is their instrument of success, how they dominate the game. There's no way to not talk about it. But with female athletes, there is an element of sexualization that comes with the talking, the observation, the existence of the body in and of itself. In order to be an athlete, there are some baseline things that you need to have. You need to have strength, flexibility, agility. And the beautiful thing about being an athlete is that athletes come in all shapes and sizes. You can even just look at the Olympics, the Olympians, and see that there is no specific mold for being an Olympian. There is no specific mold for being an athlete. But when it comes to, uh, when it comes to female athletes, there seems to be a standard that women are still set to, that they still have to fit a certain amount of femininity even when they are an athlete, a certain amount of sexualization that happens to their body. And this happens so much so that in the masculinization of female athletes' bodies, it calls into question their femininity and how much are they really a woman. They are can be considered a freak. So if you see a woman, she's got abs, she's got biceps, traps, great quads, all of those things, and they're very toned, very defined. If she's just generally muscular, you will instantly have people saying things that they never would even think of saying to a male athlete. Even just, even just the act of touching weights will have some people saying, oh, you don't want to get too bulky. Men don't like that. Or you look like a man. People have said this plenty of times to athletes like, like Serena Williams, Allison Felix, and it is constantly, it is littered all throughout the different, um, the different comments on YouTube videos, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, everywhere. People will say that female athletes look like men because they are muscular, because they are physically strong and fit. And it's wrong. Very, very obviously, it is, there is something wrong with that statement. And now I want to read something that I wrote. People can't just view female athletes as supremely skilled humans being the best in the world at their sport. It also has to include, but does she look good while doing it? It seems like there's an underlying question, an underlying belief that there is no way for this woman to be doing all of these amazing feats, all these amazing things, having the body of, quite frankly, a god, honestly. There's no way for her to be doing all of these things obviously she has to be a man and that doesn't make any sense and this to me comes from the fact that some people don't see this woman as an athlete who happens to have a sexy body they see her as a female body falling outside of the sexualized norm that happens to be performing athletic feats because when people see a woman with muscles when some people see a woman with muscles with that definition, that muscle tone, they think, oh, this 
does not make sense. This does not compute. This does not fit into the very rigid boxes of what femininity is and what masculinity is. Therefore, this female-bodied person must actually be a man. Or sometimes they completely recognize that the person is female. And in order to just bring that person down or to make them question their um, their gender, make them question their gender expression, they will call them a man because they feel like their opinion matters. Not very sure why. The bottom line is that muscular women threaten the binary understanding of what masculinity is and what femininity is. And it typically comes from people whose opinions don't matter. So it is something that we as a society have to do in unlearning that physical strength is just for men, that that is a, um, a characteristic that belongs solely to men and that it cannot exist ever at all in women because a strong body, a healthy body should be for everybody. And that's all I have to say about the policing of female athletes' bodies. Moving on now to the policing of women's bodies with respect to uniforms. Even at the top of the top, the best of the best on the world stage, women's bodies are still out there to be looked at. And you can see that in the requirements set forth for uniforms. And totally get it, we all know. Men and women have different bodies, different parts, we get that. But there shouldn't be that much of a difference when it comes to uniforms. And there are some sports that do this very well. Uh, taekwondo, everyone wears the same uniform. Uh, powerlifting or wrestling, S table tennis, skating, any of the bicycling, any of those kinds of things, the men's and women's um, uniforms are pretty much the same. But then there are some sports that, it, that get it so wrong. And one of them, uh, being handball and something that recently made news was the Norwegian handball the women's Norwegian handball team they wore probably two or three inch inseam shorts to one of their um, to one of their tournaments one of their games and they ended up getting fined seventeen hundred dollars how are you going to find someone for wearing shorts that doesn't make sense to me and it's not that they were wearing shorts that were too short. No, they were wearing shorts that were too long. When do we ever see that happen? Well, what they were supposed to be wearing was bikini bottoms. Now we have all been to the beach. We know what bikini bottoms look like, but to give the actual wording that is in their handbook, in the International Handball Federation handbook, Female athletes must wear bikini bottoms with a close fit and cut on an upward angle toward the top of the leg. The side width must be of a maximum of 10 centimeters. And 10 centimeters, because I am an American, we do not use the metric system, that is four inches. So you can only, they're only supposed to have four inches of clothing on their bottoms. Whereas the men, on the other hand, get to wear shorts that are not too baggy and 10 centimeters above the kneecap. Do you see the problem here? I hope you do, because there is no reason what, like even just wondering, why'd you have to get that specific? Why did you have to talk specifically about what it is that the women are supposed to be wearing, having to wear bikini bottoms, having to explain what it should look on their bodies. Whereas for men, you can just say, shorts 10 centimeters above the kneecap. Who wrote this? Probably a man. I'm just gonna say probably, or at least probably a group of men wrote the International Handball Federation handbook. So it's like, hmm. Hmm. I mean, they put it in writing. They put their sexism in writing is what I'm saying. And my thing is if shorts don't hinder a person's ability to perform, to compete at the level that they are used to, why is it something that is being made a requirement? Because 
The person who wrote it's not competing, obviously. The person who wrote those words, uh, uh, the rules just explaining what the bikini bottoms need to look like, obviously is not competing in those bikini bottoms. So it's coming from people who aren't even going to be impacted by what it is that they're writing. And my thing is that when, uh, when someone is doing their sport, when someone is in their zone being a supreme athlete, and not even just a supreme athlete, even if you are at the college, high school, middle school, whatever, any kind of athlete deserves to feel comfortable and secure in what it is that they are wearing because that's not supposed to be something that they should be worrying about as they're trying to compete. And if you are someone who, hearing that they had to pay $1,700 for wearing, that they were fined $1,700 for wearing shorts and you don't think that's right, there is a link in the description for you to sign. If you want to, you can go click that and sign a petition saying that you want for the International Handball Federation to cancel those fines because it's like the fact that the fact that that is even a rule is wrong first and foremost but canceling the fines is a good place for us to start at least right now and you can be a part of fixing the problem so a uh, large scale how do we fix this problem the people who are deciding what it is that athletes in general should wear should be athletes. Athletes should be deciding what it is that they are wearing to their competitions, tournaments, what have you. And especially for women, there shouldn't be male peoples, male groups deciding what it is that women are supposed to wear. That's a problem. It is. Because they're not going to be the ones out there having their bodies sexualized in that sort of manner. And it's even started happening where women are starting to protest that. At least with the, uh, the German gymnastics team, they wore full length unitards, not leotards, unitards, which go all the way down to the wrist and the ankle to protest the sexualization of female athletes and their uniforms. But on the flip side of that, even wearing a unitard can somehow be sexualized. Even when that unitard you are wearing for a medical necessity for a blood, blood clotting problem that you are having after the birth of, of your child. I am talking about Serena Williams. And when she wore, and it's, it's called her cat suit, when she wore that black cat suit with the red band, she looked great. But that got banned. The president of the French Tennis Federation, his name is Bernard Guidicelli, said, I think we sometimes went too far. The combination of Serena this year, for example, it will no longer be accepted. You have to respect the game and the place. How is what she was wearing disrespectful to the game or the place? I'm obviously not seeing what it is he's seeing. And when I sit there, I'm just thinking, how many Grand Slam titles have you won? The answer is zero. And it is com like this comment, these decisions about what it is that's happening to women's bodies, specifically in this case to Serena, Serena Williams's body and her uniform, it's coming from someone who doesn't even play, is a glorified spectator and will never be as great as she is at the sport. I mean, but that's also like every person. No one will ever be as great as Serena Williams is. If there is anyone who understands and has a respect for the sport and the place, the thing that she has dedicated her entire life to, it's going to be Serena, Serena Williams. It's going to be the athletes themselves that know what it is that they are putting into to the sport that they love not some not some group of people in suits that probably can't even do five push-ups so it should be the women the people themselves that are actually going to be in the uniforms deciding what it is that their uniform should look like as long as they are able to compete at the caliber the high caliber that they have set for themselves as long as there is no way for the 
uh, the clothing to hinder their ability, then they should be able to wear whatever it is that they want to wear. This is the final section, and it is a bit of a sensitive topic because we're going to be talking about hormones, what makes a person female, male, what makes a person a woman or a man because gender and sex are two different things. Um, I am a cis woman, born, um, born XX. I love being a woman, my pronouns are she, her, hers. So that is my experience. And I know that not everyone has that, ex that same experience. Not everyone also views um, or understands gender and sex being different and that sometimes they don't have to agree. And even just beyond that, uh, sex is not so simple as XX is female and XY is male. There are intersex people that live among us. And even though they are not the majority of people within the world, they still exist and we still need to talk about them. So uh, with that little preface out of the way, the policing of female bodies with respect to hormones, even down to the molecular level, there are still powers out there that are trying to police what it means to even be a woman and they're doing it at the hormonal level. How is this, how, how is femaleness, maleness, how is a person's sex such a big issue that it has to be verified or even tested at the molecular level? And you can pause right now if you wanna think about that. But here is a very quick history lesson and also, Hold up. Um, the policing with respect to sex and hormones of female athletes, it pretty much exclusively happens to African women, not African American women. It pretty much happens to, or, or Jamaican women, because we understand Jamaican women are always going to win the short distance, um, the short distance races, and that American women are pretty much going to win a lot of the relays. Like we get that. But the mid and long distance um, races that typically tend to be dominated by African women, those are the people that are getting, um, that are getting targeted by the sex testing on a hormonal basis. So quick history lesson. Only women have ever been, have ever had to have their sex tested to prove that they were real women with, when competing. Sex verification tests began in 1950 with the International Association of Athletics Federation, the IAAF, using physical examinations. So female athletes would have to strip down, show the phenotype of their body, and that would be how they would prove that they are female. Chromosome testing was introduced by the International Olympic Committee during the 1968 Summer Olympics. I already talked about earlier how it, like people don't always just have the chromosomes XX or XY. There are some people that are in the middle of that or have an extra chromosome. And the IAAF stopped sex screening for all athletes in 1992, but retained the option of assessing the sex of a participant of a participant should suspicions arise, which th that doesn't mean anything. That doesn't help your case in any way to say, but we, but we'll still do it if, if, if we have, if someone's suspicious, we'll still do it if someone is too good. That's basically what they're saying. In 2009, the IAAF switched to testosterone levels as a method of sex testing for women. And I will say that again because I feel like it is a very important distinction. It is a very important. They are choosing testosterone levels as a method of sex testing for women. Anything more than five nanomoles per liter was enough to give someone a statistical advantage in the 400 meter, 800 meter, one mile and hurdles events. The first person to be on the receiving end of these new rules was Castor Semenya. She had made fantastic PRs 
so many seconds. She had made a 24 second PR, I believe, in the mile and an eight second um, PR in the, eight, in the 800 meter run, which you might sit there and be like, it's just eight seconds, it's just 24 seconds. In track and field, literal milliseconds matter. So in the 800 and the mile, these are very big um, jumps to make. And originally they thought that it was drugs. She did not do drugs. And that that's what allowed them to have, have suspicions that maybe Castor Semenya is not, not a woman. So she went through hormonal sex testing and even the like the one sentence descriptor that starts off her Wikipedia page is Castor Semenya is an intersex woman assigned female at birth with XY chromosomes and naturally elevated testosterone levels. So that's a lot of things. That is a lot of things to try to unpack. I, I already said at the beginning, sex and gender are two very different things and they don't necessarily have to match. They can be a little mixed. After learning that she does have higher testosterone levels, she is told that she has to take testosterone lowering, lowering drugs if she wants to compete and she loves her sport. So she does, she takes these testosterone inhibiting drugs for five, six years, goes to two Olympics, still wins gold in the 800 and the 800 meter at the 2012 and the 2016 Olympics. She's just great. She's just amazing. That is what she does. And throughout those entire five or six years that she was taking those drugs, she has said, she told them that they're causing her severe abdominal pain, nausea, that she feels terrible taking them. And still she is able to win first, not on one occasion, but two. And the, the thing is that this is still happening even today. Even in the 2020 Olympics, this is still happening. Two Namibian 400 meter runners, Beatrice Masalingi and Christina Mboma are being banned from competing at their natural testosterone levels because they fall above that five nanomolar per liter mark. And my thing is testosterone is generally considered to be the male hormone. That's what we learn about it as in high school health class. Testosterone is the male hormone and estrogen is the female hormone. But that is a oversimplification because testosterone exists in both men and women and estrogen exists in both men and women, even though it is considered the female hormone. So why is it that femaleness is defined for these athletes as staying below a maximum testosterone level and not as having a minimum estrogen level? Why is it that femaleness is being held up against how male you are. That's what it sounds like to me. And you can tell me if you don't think that's what it sounds like, but why is it that they are having, why is it that they are being tested on how much of the male hormone that they have and not how much of the female hormone they have? That is something that just does not make sense to me. Even though their bodies do have more test higher levels of testosterone, their development though was still primarily orchestrated by the estrogen. So how do we fix this issue of mostly white male boards policing and defining what makes a woman? How do we have mostly white male boards trying to define or explain set out rules for what it means to be a woman, for how someone is a woman or is not a woman. How is femaleness defined by not producing a certain threshold of a male hormone? And why is sex status so scrutinized for women in comparison to traditionally male development standards? These are questions that I am not fully equipped to answer. They are questions that I think about, questions that if I was on the Olympics board, on the international XYZ track and field 
any of those boards, these are things that we would have to think about because these people exist. They want to partake in sports and, and they deserve to. They deserve to because it's not like Castor Semenya went through her whole life knowing that she had XY chromosomes, knowing that she was intersex, knowing that she had elevated testosterone levels. She didn't do that. She went through her life as uh, being socialized as a woman, using she, her pronouns, I assume. And that is what she knew herself to be. Without science, there would be no way of saying that she is not a man. She is not a woman, sorry. Without science, there would be no way to say that she is not a traditional cis woman. So it's a lot to think about. I don't necessarily have all of the, all, and I am also just one opinion. I don't have all of the answers. I don't have all of the philosophical or scientific know-how to make these kinds of decisions. Um, but the fact that people like Semenya, people like Mbona, people like Masalingi, um, I consider them women. That's just me. I consider them as women because they were assigned female at birth. They were socialized as women their entire lives, whether that's, uh, 25 years or whether that's because the, the, um, the Namibian girls, they're, they're just teenagers right now. They haven't even been here for more than 20 years, but they were socialized as women for their entire lives and they developed a body consistent with the female phenotype. Uh, if they are winners at their events, then it's not just because of their hormones, it's because they are better athletes. Because you, my thing is that it can't just be a hormone that is making Castor Semenya win. It can't just be that. She has to, and also a hormone is not going to automatically give someone a gold medal. It's going to take grit, it's going to take practice, dedication, perseverance, all the things that make someone a supreme athlete cannot be found in a bottle. And that is true. Uh, it's not the super, super soldier serum. But that is everything I have to say. This has been a long video and thank you very much for watching. If you have any thoughts that you want to share about the policing of women's bodies, their uniforms, their hormones, um, please go ahead and say something in the comments. Please also sign that petition calling for the cancellation of the fines that were placed on the Norwegian women's handball team. And thank you very much for watching. I will see you in another video. Bye.